Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to this week's Live Sound webinar, where we're going to try to demystify networking uh, for you. But before we go there, uh, a couple of ground rules. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, the audio and video is disabled for everybody uh, uh, participating in the, the webinar, except for the panel members, of course, um, as well as the chat room. There is a Q&A section where you can post uh, your questions and hopefully you know, during or towards the end of the webinar, we will be able to address you know, some of your questions um, and get to there uh, accordingly. So without further ado, let's kick it off with our host, uh, Rob Allen, who will introduce uh, the panel members to you uh, and actually also uh, announce one of the panel members who is missing, uh, Luca Giaroli, unfortunately, uh, had to cancel out very last minute, but over to you, Rob, uh, to do the rest of this. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar on demystifying networking. Um, I'm happy to welcome today uh, Bart, Bart Swinnen, uh CEO of Luminex. A uh, good friend of ours, somebody that we work with in Avid uh, a lot. Um, we also have with us uh, Justin Arthur, who's a networking manager, does some amazing big events, uh, sports events, uh, Soki Winter Olympics, national uh, celebrations in the Middle East, and some huge networking events. And unfortunately, uh, my very good friend, Luca Giaroli, who um, probably was doing an age inappropriate sport over the weekend <laughs> and probably shouldn't be driving motorbikes into trees, but um, uh, so I'm, he's not going to uh, be able to attend today's event as he's not very well um tree one uh italian roadie zero um so here we go let's let's kick it off hey bart how you doing welcome to this event hello everyone uh, nice uh thank you for having me uh, having us here so uh yeah we've had to kind of rearrange we had to rearrange it really quickly right with our, our mate uh, Luca un unavailable um so we're, but we'll we got lots to talk about. We're going to dive straight through it. So, so where are you now, Bart? Um, the, the elephant in the room is the COVID thing. We're, we're all in lockdown. I guess you're locked down somewhere in Belgium. Can you tell me? Are, are you are you working? What are you working on uh, while you're not allowed to travel? Well, um, most people here at Luminex are still working from home as far as that's possible. So a few operations going on here at Luminex where we, uh, we have our office still fully operational. So we're able to service all the people out there still and uh, make sure that everyone gets what they need. Um, as we all know, this is a very tough time for the event industry. So, uh, but we're we're getting we're getting through that and let's let's think creative in this time. So, uh, so have things slowed down for you? I mean, have sales slowed down? Obviously, we're you know. Um, obviously, yes, as uh, uh, a big part of what Luminex does on, on, on network switches as well in, uh, in data distribution and lighting is, is, is very closely related to larger scale events, so uh, which are not happening uh, worldwide at the moment. Of course, of course. Uh, Justin, in Australia, truly, it's a truly international webinar, so you're all the way down under. So the, this is the night time for you, so thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. What are you up to right now, man? Uh, just at home, working on... Basically, we work on a, a lot of uh, tenders and specifications for uh, potential jobs or jobs coming up. Um, but this last week or last two weeks at start is sort of quieting quite down a bit um, with those requests because everyone's not too sure what's happening. Because people... Yeah, people don't know what's happening, right? We we don't know. I can, yeah. you know, in my world, I go, oh yeah, we've rescheduled it for October, and I, oh great, okay, well at least I've got some work in October, and it's like, ah oh, yeah, that hasn't happened, so we're going to reschedule it for more. So there's just a lot of rescheduling going on without any kind of real things happening. Is that the same for you? Yeah, that's the same for us at the moment, but definitely. But you got you got some work to be kind of prepping for the future, I guess. You got some work that you're working on. Yeah, luckily for us, we've got a fair bit of con consulting work that we can do. You know, for future events that are coming up, so um, it keeps us relatively occupied for the time. Yeah, there. so I guess it's like even huge events like the Olympics were cancelled, right? It's just, just extraordinary, huge holes in in our industry's work um, for all of us. Um, have you, yeah. have you, you must be feeling now. You feeling now the same? You know. Yeah, I, I'm normally out there on on jobs, plugging stuff in, and you know, 
doing stuff I'm not seeing at home. Yeah, that's... Know, in front well, of the computer the whole time. And I, I kind of need to get out there and do something, I feel. <laughs> kind of right. trapped, which I'm sure most people do, anyway. Absolutely. I've, I've taken up gardening for something to do just to get, you know, just to get myself active, get a, get away from the computer screen. Uh, <laughs> you know, our industry is based on there being lots of people in the same place, having a kind of having a moment, right? Um, so uh, virtual events, you see that happening? If you, are we going to do, you know, the opening of the Olympics virtually or something? Is, is that going to happen? Oh, it's so hard to say, isn't it? You know, and, and these, these events are all about you know, the, the country's coming together in one place yeah. and competing. So I don't know how we would do that virtually. Um, yeah. I guess it's something we, yeah, it's just crazy, isn't it? Imagine, imagine even the 100 meters race, you know, each, each, each athlete is running 100 meters in their own, yeah, that, in their own country. That, how, how mad is that? Um, yeah. Anyway, um, and Chris Lambrex, since uh, Luca has fallen out with a tree, uh, I'm going to actually make you a panel member today um so chris what are you up to in the lockdown well um unlike luca who does stuff uh on a on a bike with a motor <laughs> i sort of do it on a bike without a motor so uh, i do a little bit of cycling uh, i mean obviously we we keep working right rob uh, we we work from home um, um but you know no traveling uh, for us either so um a lot of testing, you see these desks behind me, so Avid continues to develop on the software side, you know, actually allows us to sit at home and do a lot, a lot of testing um, together with Luminex, because that was one of the last things that we developed, the Star Network topology. Um, yeah, and you know, just try to stay busy, do a lot of webinars also for, for people who want to learn about our desks, etc. so yeah. Just cool. try to keep things going. Excellent. So, um, okay, let's start with this then. Um, Bart, so just to find a network, we, you know, we're here to demystify networks. Let's start by going, well, well what is a network? Well, I think uh, we can we can think uh, of a network in, in a very wide way, I think. Uh, it's starting from very uh, classical connecting uh different devices together whether it's it doesn't need to be particular ethernet when we talk about the network so uh it's it starts already from from years years ago where, where we where we were connecting end devices whether it's audio lighting video control or anything together from the moment you try to bring data from one point to multiple other points and so on you're you're actually networking and patching things together to to get data flowing or what well, we call it data today but uh, whether it's analog or your digital or or packet ethernet uh, um, data it's 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 what we call a network today i think and and yes in particular we will we will go deeper i think uh, later on in, in in the ethernet part of that sure sure so so justin you know you've been doing this a long time networking it, it's, it's not you know nowadays it's you know Ethernet based or fiber based or, or coax based, but you know, I guess even you could say an analog patch be in a studio was a network to begin with, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and anything that, as Bart said, you take one thing and try and distribute it to multiple destinations. It's it's basically a network. And um, when did you when did you kind of because you, you know you work a lot now in networks, right? That's the kind of the the body of your work. So. When did you decide? Okay, th this looks like an interesting area to get involved in. Maybe I can, you know, maybe, maybe this is a kind of job prospect. How, how did you get involved from, when, when, you know, with that? Yeah, well, when I started, I actually started working in comms communications. Um, ah. Yeah, so, you know, back then it was all, you know, two wire party line, or it was, um, it was a, you know, they called the digital matrix, but all the, all the connections to all the, the key panels were analog. Um, so that's, cool. that's basically where I started. And from there, you can you sort of start to see where everything starts to progress into the IP networks. What, what was the first, what was the first kind of IP based kind of comms that you were working on? What would that have been? Well, I, I probably stopped doing comms per se and started doing audio uh, before it sort of went IP uh, yeah. comms. Um, probably, I want to say, 
I'm trying to remember when uh, World Youth Day was in in, uh, in Sydney, but that that was the point where it was like, okay, this networking is is where we're headed. We're the Olympics. Away. Yeah. No, no. Uh, World Youth Day um, in Sydney. I. I, I find it interesting that you mentioned the comms because that suddenly makes me think of, you know, you know, old telephone operators sitting in front of mm. huge patch panels thing to some extent that's even a network, right? Or that is yeah, actually exactly. a network as well, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So so Bart, you know, you, you guys started in in light ten. So it always felt to me that the light ten is always a little a couple of steps ahead of the audio in, in my in our industry, in the live sound industry, in the concert industry if you like. Um, so switches happened earlier in, in, in lighting, right? The data transfer was way more, was way quicker. Yeah. Does that make sense? I, th I think, yeah. Well, um, actually our roots are in, in lighting and then we originally started as Luminex lighting control equipment eh? and, and because of doing network switches, we changed that to network intelligence because we saw it's not only lighting control and, and maybe you're right that in lighting there were a few network protocols that that brought uh, the mix data to to different places in a very easy way but on the other end we also see that the the protocols we see today in audio are much more enhanced and time critical than than what we need in in lighting control today so for us it's a it's a convergence from coming from lighting routes actually into audio bringing switch technology um, we did came across already a lot of things in, in lighting because the reason we do switches is that uh, often, often people point to the switch as, as, as the problem maker. And, and when we first did only uh, network tools like converters, um, they, were po they were telling, well, it's your converter is not acting correctly. But in the end, when we did the support, we noticed that their network infrastructure was was not behaving correctly or was not set up or configured correctly and that was actually the trigger for luminex to go into into switch networking actually and start developing our own switches to make sure that we have a a full solution for these applications and and of course that opened up uh, directly at that time actually with with ether sound being one of the protocols uh, we became one of the very first validated ether sound uh, switches downstream actually and uh, so that was our step into audio and and we we could all bring already some field experience we had from the lighting um, and yeah that's 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 our way in 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 that yes yeah but i would I... not say that it's that they're they're faster because we know either sound was there cobra net was 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 there before uh, and and what we mainly see is that uh, protocol are much more enhanced and actually today we can learn from audio and video industry on the protocol side to bring that kind of technology as well back to the lighting part so it's a really good mix that we where, where we can make uh, use of at the moment yeah so i remember you know the the analog to digital transition i remember I stood behind my big analog desk with all the effects units and stuff and the lighting guy who was behind me had his desk seemed to get smaller and smaller and smaller as he was going becoming digital the desks were getting tiny and i'd be taking an hour to pack up my stuff and he'd be gone in five minutes and he'd be on the wine he'd be on the bus drinking the, the good wine so I, that was when i kind of got involved in the digital transition it was a huge revolution from analog to digital um so, Justin, do you think that the revolution which we're going through right now, and I believe we are, which is from the digital to, to networking, do you think it's going to be as big a, a, a revolution in our industry as it was from analog to digital? Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Now, looking at all the protocols available and, and the things you can do with networks, you, you're not constrained to, you know, the building that you're in. You know, you can do links to multiple buildings within a complex or, or even even wider things like that so yeah to it's just going to expand our capabilities you know in connectivity past in connectivity that. in terms of the number of channels and the distance between the channels and stuff like that right and exactly what are you? yeah we went from analog to as as being two channels and then up to maddy 56 it's all getting more channels on less cabling um and being able to send it further and that's important for for the for the huge events, right? Because there's thousands of microphones in the audience. There's the presenters. There's the the band playing. There's the all of the stuff going on, right? Yeah, exactly. Can you imagine trying to do some of the events that you've done, you know, back in the analog days? How would you have done it? 
Uh, good question. I don't know. Yeah, you, you yeah. couldn't, right? It would have been some, impossible. Yeah, some of the broadcast compounds, the, the, the cable runs from basically my room in, in some of the stadiums there, up to a kilometre away from my room, where we used to be all the audio. So, yeah, kilometre of copper cable, it's not going to sound very good at the other end. Yeah, well, that's the advantage. Isn't it? That's one of the advantages. I guess one of the advantages is, is, is audio quality, loss of quality, you know, Copper Snake was uh, just a big low pass filter, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, what are the other advantages then of networking? What 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 else does it give us? What else does it give us in in, in the event, the kind of events that you're doing? Um, uh, a lot of control, uh, a lot of um, optics into what's going on. Um, certainly, you know, for events like that, we we have so many different power feeds into the into the system coming from different generator farms and we've got the ability to connect Ethernet to UPSs to look at voltage and frequency and load and all that sort of stuff. So that gives us great visibility on that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, we can monitor temperature in racks, um, whether or not an amplifier is faulty. It just gives you a lot of data right there on your computer that you can it helps you make a make a decision or see or catch something before it goes wrong. So you're not just about distributing the audio, right? You're about controlling the whole environment in which audio is. Certainly. Sorry. No, carry on. That was it. Yeah, certainly the events that, that we do, you know, um, you know like the Olympics and, and, and shows of that size, you know, there's such critical events that you, there is no room for failure on anything. Um, so, you know, having UPSs and seeing, you know, that there's a, a, a you know, the load on the UPS has changed, okay, so maybe someone's plugged a vacuum cleaner into our power distro or a kettle or whatever and it's going to take <laughs> us out. Yeah, well, we can see all that kind of stuff before before it becomes a problem. Awesome. Um, so here's a one that's close to my heart. So remote control, you know, are we going to get to the stage in the future of our industry where because everything's networked, um, you know, I'm leaning on basically a, a bunch of computers that are networked together to, to form a mixing desk. Can I sit here at home and 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 see just in Spain and mix a concert in Australia in the future? Is that is that you know are we are, as our networks if it, as our networks extend are they going to be global? Do we can I stop going on tour? Obviously, that's uh, yeah. close to my heart. <laughs> that I think that day is coming. I don't think we're there just yet. Um, there's still a few obstacles to overcome there, but you know, there's certainly there is the technology and probably the bandwidth to do to do things like have a concert you can sit at home and mix it at home and send it back to the arena um you know over time will those uh connections will become more reliable and um bandwidth will be greater so you, it, you know give we've, it time we've and be, i think we'll be we've, there we've begun to see that already right people are saying mm. at home you know you like Luca, I was going to ask Luca about this because uh, Luca's done some work on this. You get four musicians sitting in their, in their houses and they're not allowed to speak to each other, but they split the screen in four, they're all playing along with each other. And it's kind of, you know, it's not a gig and I miss gigs, but we're beginning, that technology's had a little push, I think. Yeah, definitely. Luca, uh, um, I think they did it, was it last week maybe? Um, yeah, they basically did exactly as you said. Had a couple of musos link up, um, you know, small small bandwidth, um, you know, small steps at a time. But I think soon yeah. we'll be seeing big chunk outs. It's not going to be the same, Crystal, is it? It's never the same as as going to a gig. No, it isn't. Uh, but but one of the things that that was just mentioned by by all of you guys as as well is I I think it's it's interesting, the 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 scenarios that still are. Need, need to be developed or even need to be invented. It sort of reminds me of, you know, the, the early multi-track days where surely with 16 tracks you have enough, right? Surely with 32 tracks you have enough. And now we have hundreds and unlimited tracks and people find creative digital revolution into mixers was the same. Why do you need more than 24 channels on a desk to mix a rock and roll band? And then we end up going speak to someone like Mark Roland who's mixing Muse and and he just comes up with these very intuitive ways to to duplicate channels and create different sound palettes, et cetera, et cetera, and, and make good use of more channels. I think to some extent, networking 
is going to bring us into a similar environment where we give tools to people and people are becoming creative and being, you know, just start doing things which previously were impossible. And that's one of the beautiful things of it, isn't it? Like, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big rev. The first time I mixed a band in an arena, uh, I had 14 channels on my desk. I had the support right. band on the same desk. There was plenty of channels on the desk. Um, and now, like you say, no self-respect and pop bands going to go out with less than 100 channels on their desk now. And, and then I guess you multiply that into the huge events, like the, I don't know, the, know, the halftime at the, at, the, uh, at the Super Bowl and stuff or the Olympic opening ceremonies. And, and there's never enough channels. There's never enough control. Um, so... <laughs> How do you, you know, how do you build a network? If you, if you're a pro, Bart, if you're approached for a project uh, that that Luminix need to be involved in, what are the kind of fundamental building blocks that people will will start with when they, they start to build a network, like synchronous well, versus asynchronous, for example? Or yeah, I think uh, one of the main questions to ask from from the beginning is is what is the purpose of of your application actually and. What do you want to achieve in it? Eh? And then if you take synchronous and asynchronous as an example, there's, there's a big difference in, in deploying a network or setting up an ethernet network where you need uh, the outplay of every music sample at the, at the correct time at every different location because you're, you're dealing with delays or, or facing and, and all that. Um, but if it's just a play out of music and that doesn't matter, then, then, then the challenges are much different on a network and you don't need that accurate timing protocols in place and all that. So it's very important to start right there and, and, and explain what is your application, what do you want to achieve, what, what is it being used for. And, and then synchronous, asynchronous is one example and you can, you can, you can ask multiple questions in there. Do you need redundancy? Do you, do you want to do more than one thing on that network and so on? And, I'm sure that, that, that also Justin came into applications there where, where they're totally different from each other. And, uh, and when I heard him talking about monitoring even uh, the, the power farm of, of generators, for example, that, that's a totally different aspect than bringing real time or uh, time critical audio from one place to another place. So, uh, yeah, interesting. So, like an, so just, just to be clear, so a synchronous uh, network would be, for example, AVB, where if I send an output to several speakers on different nodes on, on a network, they would be synchronous in terms of their output, right? Yeah, very with a, with a, yeah, with a protocol like AVB, we know exactly that, uh, that, that uh, the, the, the clock is, is fully in, in sync with, with very low margin on an or jitter, as, as, as we call it, which, which allows us to, to play out uh, sample accurate at, at every output. Eh? So you can even use that in, in, in line array systems to, to, to beam steer audio from, from such systems and, and so on. So, and, and at a very high quality of, of audio and uh, compared to asynchronous where you just stream audio, um, well, we can, we can take Spotify as an example. If you're, if you're listening to your Spotify or if someone is streaming audio and, or you're listening to a YouTube uh, channel and, you can be sitting in the in the same place listening to each other to 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 each device and they they are not necessarily in sync you're just listening to it but right. it's not important they they are they are in sync in in outplay for example and with with professional audio applications well like getting all your microphones inputs or all your inputs at at a at at a accurate timing into the desk to be being processed and toward the output to to even use this in in a, in a, in line array system, for example, that's where you need a very accurate uh, synchronous system, and there's a huge difference in in, in rollout of that. Got cool, yeah. So Justin, it felt to me like a little bit of a tipping point when the speaker manufacturers started to use networking. Uh, would you agree with that? Be you know, all of all of a sudden we got network all the way from the desk all the way to the amplifiers, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's. I think who was to do that first? Maybe it was was it Lake with maybe PLMs and Dante yeah. on their PLMs? Yeah, um, it's been around for a while, um, but yes, most recently, I guess our acoustics have come along with their AVB um, system. Um, yeah. Mayor are using AVB. I believe Adamson yes. are. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
DMB. Uh, I don't know if they're using AVB or using MADI, but it seems to me that most people have moved. It seems that when, as soon as the speaker manufacturers moved onto the networking, then the networking was not just a thing that was connecting to two PCs, you know, it wasn't connecting the stage box to the desk anymore. It was it was the network kind of spread out and now it's it's all around the building. Does that make yeah, sense? Exactly. That... Yeah, you you know you you've had you you various consoles have had a, a network connection to a stage rack of some kind. Um, yeah. so there was just that one network path from stage to front of house. And now as you say, you know, all the manufacturers are coming in online with not only control but audio, um, audio transfer on the network. You've got amp racks in the roof doing delays. You've got the stage left, stage right. You know, they're, they're basically everywhere through your system. And yeah, as you say, it's branched out um, massively. And now, you know, if you've got a, if you're doing broadcast or whatever, you can just roll out a piece of fiber out to the broadcast truck and drop a box or even just plug straight into their protocol and yeah, and you're done. You're done. That's, that's it. You know, it used to be a bunch of XLRs out of the back of the desk and the speaker control and stuff. And now it's it's a piece of fiber or a piece of Cat five, and and then we can yeah. we can sit in the control space someplace and see everything that's going on at the same time, can't we? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of beautiful and and, uh, and remote control. That's that's kind of helpful thing to have, isn't it? So Chris, um, to, to kind of get us into this, Chris, I. Could you share your screen? Chris has got a diagram. Chris and I work on on installations for um, for Avid. We we will come up with some concepts for like you know multi space theaters, and we thought it might be useful to just talk you through um, the kind of things that we go. So, Chris, um, this is uh this is something that we were working on. Um, yes. So talk us um, through. Yeah. So this is a is is a project. Um, basic background a little bit. It it consists of two performance hall two performance halls one is a small hall um, which basically has a stage uh, a, a front of house position and then also um, upper balcony there's a control room and then there's also an amp room and these different locations in that room need to interconnect and the, the communication there is running over fiber now that fiber is going to transport a multitude of things it can be in our case avb but it can also be uh, madi which goes uh, into the amp rooms and then it's converted to AES and analog and, and some network protocols for the control of the amps, et cetera, et cetera, as well. Um, the second room, which we call then uh, the, the, the main hall, um, has a multitude of positions as well. There's a stage, um, which has, uh, in our case, a, a, an Avid console for, for doing monitors. There's a front of house position, which also has an Avid console to do uh, front of house. Um, and then there's a control room position with a third console in there as well. And then there's a machine room, which centralizes all the IO, uh, which in this case is going to be three stage 64, so a total of 192 inputs, and an amp room again, which sort of manages what comes out of the speakers in, in the main hall, right? So let's maybe zoom in on that main control room because that's where most of the control is going to sit. We see uh, in, in that, in that picture, you you see the three engines, so the three uh, processors for all three consoles, uh, monitors, front of house, and uh, control room are sitting in there. Uh, the third control surface, the 32D, is sitting in there as well. And if you follow the red lines and the red dotted lines, those are connected to uh, switches. In this case, Luminex uh, uh, 26i. Uh, the way the way we support Star Network uh, redundancy is basically that we take our A ports are connected to a, a switch and the B ports go to a B switch, which gives us the redundancy that we would normally deploy on a ring, right? In this case, on a star, uh, allows us for more flexibility. Uh, Bart can maybe explain later on why there's a hop limitation in in uh, the number of devices that you can connect on a ring. Star topologies open up uh, a lot more flexibility there as well. There's also uh, a MADI network running there, which uses uh, uh, actually direct outs M1K2s, which are very intuitive um, matrix uh, routers for MADI, uh, remote controllable as well and programmable. And 
those yeah, taken... we were we were going to get uh, uh, Luca to talk to that, of course, and he's yeah, uh, so... unfortunately not going to be here. Uh, but but carry on, yeah. So the 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 Madi side is is the audio transport, and actually the, the Madi. And if I bring in the next slide, uh, there's also a little bit of a, a Milan. Uh, so we have uh, audio over AVB. We'll talk to that later as well. One part of it is our own network, which is. Uh, what we want to control our I.O. devices to the outside world. There's a, a, an open standard called uh, Milan, which allows us to communicate with amplifiers, other devices that speak AVB. Um, and then the MADI part is to go from analog to digital to whatever format you want. It's sort of the, the, the Swiss knife in there, which transforms any protocol to any protocol basically, right? And then, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but all these lines, the, the, the purple lines are then the fiber connections which go to uh, the, the, the amp room, which go also to the secondary room because there is an interconnection between that small hall and that main hall where we can create tie lines, etc., etc., and then distribute all these um, various protocols over there. What you do not see on this picture is that there's a big part um, in there as well, which allows the operator in that room, in that main control room, to control all of this. And Rob has mentioned this, right? Like the remote control. Remote control is not only about remote uh, mixing and distributing audio, but it's also a remote control of the amplifiers, remote control of your stage boxes, et cetera, et cetera, right? So these kind of projects, um, in the analog days, we've mentioned this a couple of days, times during the webinar, these are scenarios in the analog days would not be possible. And this is one of the examples where you now go like, wow, well, hold on a minute, we can, we can actually start deploying this and make them you know, user intuitive, reliable, et cetera, et cetera, right? Nice. So, so within a one project, several different audio standards, you got control, you got all kinds of stuff going on within the network. All, all, and you can see all of that from the control room. So you have, you have eyes on all of this. So, so um, while, while you were explaining that, I was having a little look in the Q&A section. Uh, I thought it was a great question came up. Um, I'm going to give this one to you, Justin. So what about, what about redundancy on, on your networks? And if all else fails, is there, a, is there a plan B? They said, I thought it was a great question. Yeah. De definitely in the top of shows that I do, there's always redundancy. Um, I guess the the kind of redundancy would depend on your show, but we we do a lot of it with something completely different from the main. So we we tend to stick away from things like Dante main and Dante secondary. We'll, we'll deploy optical and something else or you know two different protocols so, two so you'd have two completely separate networks for redundancy so that's right so you know if there's a a, a glitch in one network the, the likelihood of that happening in the backup at the same time is next to none right because yeah. if it was the same if it's the same network it, it could be a similar you could have a similar glitch on on on, on both sides of that redundancy so if it's it's more I guess it's more redundant if you like to have yeah, yeah do, and will you typically have different audio standards as well within within a, ne a, a network on on a huge show like that yeah in, in this sort of environment there's Maddie there's AES uh, Optical Dante um, and then the good old analog um, definitely always have an analog backup somewhere so yeah because if, if all else fails, you can always fall back on analog. It will just work. For, if all else fails, there's an XLR somewhere exactly. that somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you, is, and is that the plan B? Is is just a mic with a cable someplace and a, uh, a speaker? It, in those sort of shows, no. Like it, everything is, you know, basically if you if you were doing, if you think of maybe like a tour, yeah, you just bring two of them, like identical, you know. Pair of consoles, pair sure. of mics, everything is duplicated. Yeah, yeah. But but remember, but remember that. Remember the time when when amplifiers actually had a volume knob on them, Rob, where you had to go over there and turn them up if you wanted. That was to the last time I was interested enough to actually look at an amplifier <laughs> with a knob on it. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, now, now he doesn't have a knob, but I, I actually passed one by the other day on my way to catering and, and didn't have any knobs on it. it. had like little screen, same as everything else nowadays, right? It has a little screen and a bit of Cat5 plugged into it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I thought it was quite cool. Um, so, so redundancy, so, so your redundancy, your, your, your primary redundancy will be you, you, you have your network, your secondary will be you have some other network of a different uh, form, and then your third one is, is analog. So, man, a show like that, how, how do you, so do you have a huge big analog desk? Do you have a big old beast from back in the day as well to, to control all of that? No, it's not, it's not quite that. that it's not analog. quite that far. <laughs> so it's analog converted back into something that some digital yeah. desk is controlling. Got you. Exactly, yeah. Okay, um, back to you, Bart. As the way I was looking at this, the way I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this the other day. Is like if we're all moving to networking, every single piece of equipment I see behind me's got a switch in it, right? In the new networking world, the switch is king. So you you were really smart starting a switch company all those years ago, aren't you? Right, that was like prescient of you. Um, you got job security for a little while, I'd say. Um, what is the yeah. role of the switch? Just get, just let's break it right down. What is the role of a switch in a network? Yeah, I think I as as you as you mentioned, I think it's a big word to say. Your switch is king, but uh, and but <laughs> with, 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 with all you can have that. Switch is king. TM Luminex. Yeah, you're allowed to. <laughs> yeah, and with all the convergence we see going, actually, with bringing uh, different protocols on the network and bringing these different applications, like we we just talked about, uh, adding remote control to it, for example, is yeah. Brings also uh, a lot of a lot of challenges in in, in the network. So uh, it's indeed important to have a, a switch today in the network that that does it that does it correctly actually, or that's been uh, managed correctly in in that sense. So uh, it's 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 not only bringing us advantages, but it's also bringing us some challenges, and that's where uh, I think. Uh, our industry still has to evolve in is that and and what we're trying hard to do with with luminex is is making that that convergence uh, something more natural and without too much hurdles in it and and bringing a uh, bringing it to become part of your natural workflow as well so uh, i like to give you an example, and, and we did so we did intensively together with Avid, we did a lot of, of testing and, and validation, and, and that's what we do with with multiple applications. So we we definitely see that that uh, confidence is is the key to our uh, to our end users and people who are there to to mix audio, whether it's mixing audio or controlling light or whatever. But in the event sector, to to have uh, technical creative people working on the production actually should not worry too much on on the networking perspective so that's why we do a lot of validation so we can assure that this has been validated with with that other brand and, and we can ensure that we 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 talk the same language and we build up some application now how at luminex as well so we why do we why do you get a call from an avid user asking about uh, the network uh, People from Avid support team are, are knowing how to handle it, and Chris knows perfectly how to handle it. Um, but on, at the same way, uh, because of doing this cooperation together with, with Avid as a brand, for example, is that also we build up a lot of application now. So if from if we got that same question from our side, we can we can answer to it. But these are the challenges we we walk in today. So bringing more and more different applications together also adds. The challenge into the network to do it correctly yeah so just to be clear so but your switch you can you can split it up into vlans right so it's not like we just have to have your switch for avb your switch can also at the same time be transmitting control or dante or internet or whatever so we're just we, we're yeah. using the the infrastructure of of the cable in everything into your switch and it can be split up can you can you talk to that a little bit yeah, and uh, if you allow me, I can quickly maybe share my uh, screen with uh, with our Araneo application on it, just to show that particular bit on 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 the VLAN. Yeah, please do. If you want? And let me see if I get the right screen up here. There you go. So normally you should see my uh, my Araneo screen. Yeah, so, yeah, we're seeing it now, Bart. Yeah, looking good. Yeah, 
so yeah, well, the, first, the way we look at it is that it needs to be intuitive and, uh, and, and we're talking about VLAN and for us, this is just like, like, like in the early days, like uh, color cabling, I uh, color taping a cable and you just make, make what we call a group. Like I choose a group too, I can change the name here and I can make that my ADB network, for example, and I'm, I'm just gonna add ports to that network. And uh, so we can easily bring different network segments together and I can make a Dante network in here, for example, and have other ports in the network assigned to my Dante network. And in this way, we, we bring different, different networks, different uh, control protocols in, into one topology. And of course, if we want to have this all talking together, there is one particular one, which we call our inter-switch link, which is, I, in IT uh, words, more known as the, the trunk connection. Yeah. Uh, in here, it's just for us like, okay, because with Luminex, we have out of the box redundancy. So we know exactly that this, this port is connected to another port in here. So we can retrieve that automatically from all switches. And that allows us to set up very easy. Um, like you see now, I have set up a trunk connection between three different switches already with three different applications in it. And we want to keep it as simple as that, like you're just color coding your applications and just assign ports to it. And under the hood, we have a lot of optimizations already uh, uh, set up correctly for you. And in particular, we could look at AVB, for example, if I go into my advanced setting, the only thing I need to do is enabling this ADB tick box and I'm and I'm yeah, I remember the first the first time we started playing with switches and AVB Chris and I we had to we had to learn how to write as like 30 lines of code before even before even acknowledge the AVB and now you can just now it's a tick box that's that's cool yeah actually so actually sitting here I'm, I'm thinking of that of, you know that, that dates from our first steps in into the AVB world when we were looking at switches right Rob and yeah. that first switch that we got, it took me two days to just figure out how to, because I was used to just plugging something in and then making it work, right? It took me two days. I, I apparently needed a USB to serial connection into a little application called Puddy, which then allowed you to dial in and then had this command window. But with my background, you now I'm just a, a guy who was used to plugging in XLR cables into inputs and outputs and then making that work. It was a nightmare. And then on top of that, just to enable the AVB on that, you had to go literally what Rob says, 30 lines of command, which in my world make no sense at all, like just computer language, right? And that's where, you know, I, I look at Aranao now and I go, yeah, that's that's what the industry needs as well, right? The operator needs a tool that is intuitive um, I mean, I know in the background of your switches, there's exactly the same thing going on. If you uh, enable that switch and hit apply for AVB, probably there's 30 lines of command going on there, but I don't care about those lines of command. I just want to hit that switch and have AVB work on those on those ports, right? So, Yeah, well, uh, I think that's that's a very important part uh, that, that, that UI and that uh, interface need to need to be understandable and, and need to give you give us the right tools for 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 our industry and then I this 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 there's there's a little bit of a double side on it eh? like we often like to say with Luminex uh, we have our, our one liner like uh, AV networking made easy but under the hood it's 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 everything but easy <laughs> let's say yeah. and, and so it also means that to get confidence in such a system we also uh, you need to have some some knowledge in in that way, but then in, in the very end, we all expect that that this becomes a, a natural part of your workflow, and the user experience should be dedicated to to these kind of applications. Sure, Chris, have you got have you got Arunil connected a couple of hours? Uh, yeah, or something to... uh, I can uh, show. Why don't you check uh, that out? Let's have a look at yeah. how it looks uh, in the real world. Okay, uh, let's see. So, so this is what I currently have set up. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of things that Bart just mentioned are really similar, right? Um, 
Um, I have uh, an A environment and a B environment. So the way that we in, in Avid land think of uh, redundancies on, on our network ports, we have an A port and a B port, and then the A ports connect to A and the B ports connect to B. And actually I have some engines here. If I open up those engines, well, that's my engine connections, which go to, in my case, the AVB ports are green. Um, and uh, my IO devices, if I hide these, uh, I currently have um, two stage 64s, which are uh, communicating with uh, these ports, right? On the A and the B side. And those those two switches are acting for the, as the redundancy, right? And you can see that those lines. Those two switches are acting as the redundancy, yes. Um, and then the other two I... switches that are connected via the the network, and those are like almost like extensions of the, the same switch, right? Is that yes. what you think of it? Yes, exactly. Um, what, what this will allow us to do is create a remote location where you have six stage devices connected, and you just call in the stage devices as you need them. Right on a case by case scenario, so that's the the idea behind uh, setting up a star network or an extended star uh, how Bart would would call it um, and similar to what Bart was doing i I don't have anything up and running here, but I do have a primary and a secondary, so that's my Dante primary, so I can would go on this switch and you know, assign these ports to my Dante primary uh, and then you know, I would use my B switches for a Dante secondary and use these ports, right? And that's then how I would configure that. Dante controller would then allow me to go in and configure those devices. It's not me going in, creating command lines, which is basically what I need, right? Yeah. Um, that's just and, insanely simple now. That's that's beautiful. Great job, Bart. By the way, they've done it, such a nice job on this. Is even I can understand this. I would just I would just throw the switch at Chris and go. I, I I'm, I've lost interest. You you deal with it. I'm going to go and read the newspaper or something before. But now <laughs> now I I can now I'm understanding this, which is great. Yeah, and I Thanks. I think uh, another important aspect is, is is what you see and what you can monitor. Eh? I think maybe in an interesting point to highlight, Chris, here, and Actually, as well yeah. as uh, maybe the information uh, open this show up. in particular on, on the AVB side, for example. I yeah. not want to take too much on this, but... Uh, so yeah, no, I, I mean, Chris? yeah, I, I'm going to let this up to Bart because this is where I know a little bit but and, and just to go like, oh, yeah, there's my AVB streams, but what it all means, that's then where I lose interest and go read the newspaper. <laughs> and I can, I, I know I can, this, this tool allows me to, to get logs. And if we have a problem, I can send those off either to our yeah. engineering team or to the Luminex engineering team and go like, hey, guys, can you look at this and deal with it? Right. Yeah. Um, um, talk us through it, Bart. Yeah. Yeah. So a tool like this, where uh, Chris is now showing, for example, uh, the AVB. Uh, stream allocations that are known on a particular switch. So depending on which switch he is clicking, you will see uh, which which AVB uh, streams are going on on, on that switch. And I, I think this is a very valuable tool like for people like Justin that when you're troubleshooting or just monitoring a network, you want to have visibility on, on the application. And this gives you exactly on AVB, for example, um, we see the, the different ports and in, in how much bandwidth they are using. Um, we know, or if if you're a bit uh, known in AVB world, uh, there is a, there is a, what they say there is 75% bandwidth reservation for for AVB. So you're sure your AVB network is always available. Well, that's nicely indicated in here, but it also indicates how much exactly you're using in it and exactly are reserving on it, and how much headroom you still have on your switch yeah. for doing different applications. Um, Actually, nice. the, the the marked area on the right of the bandwidth, uh, how do you call it, the hashed area, actually is is what's never going to be used for AVB and allows us that convergence with other protocols. So there's always 25% available for other applications as well. But this tool gives you the visibility on that. And I, if, for example, Chris would hover on a, on a stream on AVB in, in, that, in that window, you can even see on, on the on the topology viewed actually in which direction and on which links those those streams 
are going. Yeah? And uh, there's right. another view where we can look per, per stream, where we can even show you the latency. We talked about, about redundancy and convergence and all that, but the latency is an important part in the network as well. So we can actually see when we talk about synchronous network, we need, there is, there is, uh, there is a certain allowed latency you, you, you have in a network and we can actually, I'm not sure if it's so clear on the screen, but you can see that up to in that switch, we have an accumulated, accumulated latency of, let's say, 470 microseconds. Is that correct? Yeah. That's, yeah, 417. Yep. 417, so, yes. And that, that brings us uh, uh, within Avid and AVB in general to, to, to make sure that you have a maximum of two millisecond latency. This is where your hop limitation comes in, but actually this tool gives you at least the numbers on what's actually there. And yeah. and, and another part is the logging that you, from every warning or error message, you get a log into, into the application. So in the end, you have some some visibility on if something happens you can look back and and can actually pinpoint to the to the fact where where did it happen and how can we avoid this in the future or did someone interact with the system and, and so on so uh, and well we uh, we are still in a process of of learning from the market as well eh? so bringing these new tools on on board and having this this uh, validation going on with Together with Abbott, we got a lot of feedback as well from you guys and how you like to see things in here. And some things are from a, from a system technician perspective and some are really on, on the application level. So Very nice. Very nice. So, um, so let's go back to you, Justin, because you're the guy out there in the field working on that. Is, is this the kind of thing that you're doing when, you, when, you're, when you're sitting there controlling your vast network, like your spider in the middle of your big network? Are, are, you checking, are you checking that's the kind of information that you need to see all the time? That's what you're looking at? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, certainly on, on a network of the this, this size that, that I'm normally um, involved in, optics yeah. on, on what's going on in a network is, is key, you know. If, if you if you can't see that a link's down or that a, one link's overloaded or, or has some packet errors on it or something, then you, you've got so much less of a chance of finding out if there's a problem or solving the problem. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you know the, the application called The Dude. I'm sure you do, but, you know, the, before Araneo, basically there was an application where I would have to build that, that exact application myself. Uh, right. Building right. blocks, so I can have that, have the optics that, that our new um, software gives us. Great. So you, so your life is getting easier. Is that because networking is becoming, networking is become is get, is coming out of the kind of little dark corner, right? The kind of the IT world, and it's becoming just a tool for a, a, a general tool that we all need to get involved in. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. If you're involved in audio, you need to have some level of IT knowledge that's for sure and um, yeah certainly things like Araneo are helping um, educate people on, on how stuff works and yeah and how to use it whereas before as we we're saying you know setting up a network like like only would before Araneo it was literally command line sitting there for hours programming switches you don't want to be doing that do you not no. be in some beautiful place <laughs> Doing the Olympic Games, you don't want to be programming switches. You want to be out there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about programming one switch, and well, I don't have any hair, but I'm tearing them out. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Justin in his networks is probably talking about I don't know how many switches, Justin, but you would have to program them all individually as well, right? Yeah. So how many switches? That's a great question. How many switches would you have on an event, you know, like the Winter Olympics or something? Well, to your hair point, I'm missing quite a bit. <laughs> that's that's where it happened to <laughs> me as well. <laughs> yeah, but typically on one of those shows, we'd have anywhere from thirty to forty switches. Yeah, as part of, as part of the, just the audio network. Um, there was one job um, that I've done before where the lighting contractor and the audio contractor are actually the same, the same team. Um, wow! So we converge both networks together, and then that. Blew out to something like 60 switches for that one. Oh, so so I'm, I, I would have thought, um, so that this is a great, great, interesting point. I would have thought that you would generally have dedicated kind of audio networks, dedicated 
video networks. So sometimes you'll have combined networks as well. Is that right? Typically, they'll be quite segregated, and we won't interact very much at all. Um, yeah. But you know, in this in this case, basically the same contractor supplied lights and audio. So from from their inventory and from their personnel, it just kind of made sense to to join it all together, and we could share that resource. Um, at the moment, the world is very much no, this is my lane, and you know, these are audio yeah. switches only, and nothing else shall you know plug into these. But as time goes on, and, and we all are further educated about you know, networking yeah. and, and the advantages of converging networks together, then I think you'll see that more and more on shows. That's I guess that's the advantage of the VLANs, right? That we were talking about before. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, in, in the shows that I do, we have six, seven VLANs, and we go down to the level of all the UPSs are on one VLAN, all the shore production on one VLAN, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can go down to having audio VLANs, lighting VLANs, video VLANs. Oh, just VLANs. just for in case people don't know, could you say what VLAN stands for? Uh, virtual LAN. Okay. Yeah. Virtual local... Area network. <laughs> Area network. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to, yeah. Well, when I, I was I was lying, I said for the people at home it was me. I just couldn't remember what it stood for. Virtual. Okay. Virtual local area network. Right. Okay. That's cool. So networking. That's going to affect our job, right? So you pretty much work in audio networking. Now I know you still mix sound as well, but a lot of your work is is audio networking. Is this something that we're going to have to do? Are are you know? I'm I mix front of house, right? I used to just mix the sound. Actually, when I used to do everything, I used to drive the van, stick up the speakers. But for a long time now, I've just mixed sound. And then I now I, I record to Pro Tools. So I mix sound, I record to Pro Tools. Uh, now with the whole streaming thing, we just did a thing about streaming. Uh, I'm going to mix the sound for, for live. I'm going to record to Pro Tools. I'm going to archive those recordings. I'm going to uh, mix for streaming. Do I, do I need to be on top of the networking as well? Do I need to do I need to be a, a network expert as well? I wouldn't say a, a network expert, but you certainly need to be educated in, in networks and, and the various protocols that we use. You know, as you said, you, you record the Pro Tools from your console, so yeah. therefore you would use ABB from the console to your laptop. So you have to therefore know something about networking, you know, about IP addresses, about, you know, the different protocols used, etc. So, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't. I don't think it matters where you are in our industry, whether you're a front of house guy, monitor guy, whether you're a system tech. You will need to know some level of IT knowledge. Definitely. Do you think as we move forward? So, for example, do you think as we, obviously on on a, on a show like you know the Winter Olympics, you're going to have a, a dedicated network manager? Do you think as we move forward, are are, are the bigger tours going to have network managers, and their their job is just you know I'm the network manager for the tour? I think so. Like if you you know just to pull a name out of the hat, if you look at someone like PRG who yeah. supply a holistic um, package for a tour, you know, audio, video, lights, everything. Um, you know, if that's all coming out of one shop and you can have the one guy from that company be the IT manager and have one converged network yeah, and make things like, you know, triggering lights and video cues from timecode from Pro Tools. You know, it's just a, an audio stream on the network. Got cool, yeah. So I guess in a way, in some ways where that happens, the network manager will kind of program it all in advance and send it out on, on the tour, right? Would that be the... Yeah. Uh, be a typical thing that you do. How long do you spend then programming, right, sending, putting code into switches and stuff before these are big events? What's the kind of lead up time to an event like the Winter Olympics? Uh, well, for the Winter Olympics, I went to the contractor's uh, office and spent a week there with them yeah. um, prepping the show. Um, and that was just getting the basics sorted, um, you know, getting all the IP addresses and the switches and naming everything and getting it the base config done. Um, but even on site, it's, it sort of doesn't stop until almost, you know, the dress rehearsal because we, because it loads in so for such a long period. Um, you know, today we're loading in this stage in this corner of the stadium. So yeah. we're adding this new device here today and oh, we need one more radio mic. So we need another port for, for a sure receiver or something like that. So 
there's always something to always something to to configure. Right. We, yeah. And you working around everybody else, I suppose. You know, it's you know, people are used to going. Okay, well, the lampies are going to fly. The the grid, the speak, the speakers are going to go. This whole the network manager needs some time to do this thing. That's 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 kind of new request, right? That's that's not something that you used to hearing on a tour. No, a exactly. Show. And uh, typically for a tour, you'll have that. You know, you're in production rehearsals, or or you you've got all the information there. You know, ready to. Yeah, to prep your show and have it basically locked down before it leaves the warehouse. There might be a little bit of tinkering in the first couple of days, but yeah. after that, you sort of you sort of set and it's just monitoring. Um, whereas in these shows, the, the creative is is somewhat in progress as we load in as well. Um, <laughs> so you know, oh, we need a microphone over in this corner of the stadium. Okay, so we need to get some receivers and maybe some knee transmitters and all these other things and put them over in that corner of the stadium and then. So there's a little bit of chaos, right? I bet you there is. So as people think those kind of big events, they look, oh, that looks, must have that all, must be really smooth, everything prepared in advance. They're making it up as they go along, right, a lot of the time. But the, 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 the base concept's there, or it's like, oh, we can't come through this one because like there's a thousand cast in the way and we have to come in over this side of the stadium now, things like that. So, it, yeah, it, it's an ever, ever-developing beast. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> we, we, the, the only thing I've ever done even remotely that is me and Chris did the, the, the kickoff for the World Cup in South Africa exactly 10 years ago. Only, only remember, we only remembered it because it came up on Facebook, right? Um, and that was like that. It was absolute chaos. We knew it was, you know, Shakira, Black Eyed Peas. And then literally the night before the thing, they went, oh, yeah, by the way, Shakira's got 200 dancers with her and the Black Eyed Peas have got 50 Burundi drummers. Or, and we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> and it's just up, up until the last second, and then there, there, there was a you remember this because there was a there was a changeover between Black Eyed Peas and, and and Shakira, and Shakira's engineer assisted on an analog desk, so it was big old analog snakes being connected, and there was thirty seconds between the two bands, and there was a billion people watching that, and I rem I'll never forget this. The line check was this. Uh, Somebody on stage plugged in the first multi, boof, and all of the the meters on the, the first half of this went, whoop, and then he plugged in the second one, poof, and all the sec, all the meters went up on the second half of the desk, and I went, give us her mic, and they went, one, two, one, two. I was like, okay, go. <laughs> and that was that was the line check. That's when I went grey. Um, so yeah, them events they're not as well organised as they can be. So you're having to adapt all the time, right? So what does that mean? You have to run out a different switch or run out some more fibers or. Uh, typically, we're a little bit more prepared than that, so we'll basically distribute nodes around the stadium, giving right. us you know access to a node within a you know, hundred meters or so of, of something that will happen. Um, cool. But yeah, there's certainly things that move around. But so yeah. the switches, you just place the switches just in case there was a switch or it's a certain area all the way around, so you're never too far from a switch. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um. Hey. Bart, so you know, what's is is the role as manufacturers? Is the is the role of a manufacturer to make the networking as as invisible as possible, as easy to understand as possible? Well, it's one of our goals. In in any case, I watch, which I told uh, a little bit before, is is doing that validation. Actually, is is which which gives us as a manufacturer a lot of application knowledge, and so. The more we understand the application or the way people need to work with it, the more um, uh, enhanced or, or, or difficult or, or, or tricky things we can we can we can cover actually or predefine or pre-program and uh, because I, there's, there's there's a lot knowledge you need to actually pre-program a switch correctly if you go from an IT managed switch. Um, actually, you, 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 today you need to know quite some insights on the protocols, on, 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 uh, on the quality of service or things like that. You need to have diff serve values, just to name a few IT words in here, but which are very uh, uh, crucial when you want to deploy a network correctly. And uh, yeah. if, if you need to understand and to learn all that knowledge as deep as far as into the protocol, actually, that, that, that part we definitely want to want to uh, to simplify and, and, and make it to the end user uh, confident to use actually. So telling that it's been validated that it's that we have this amount of jitter which is within the specification and so on and so on. So uh, 
that's I think that's that's up to the the manufacturers in our industry to to make uh, audio networking part of becoming part of the natural workflow of of a of a system technician or audio technician because we're talking here as well are uh, just and very much related to very large scale events but. I think there's also many, a lot of live events, small tours on, on the road that I come in and one day in the morning and go out at night and and there is there is no time to hassle with the network and there's maybe not the budget to have an IT manager yeah. on board. So uh, I, this, I, I, I definitely see where with Luminex, we have a, a good possibility to be in the market to, to provide that solution there. Yeah, I, yeah, I no. think you touch on a. I think you touch on a really, really important uh, part of this whole discussion as well, there, Bart, which is uh, the reliability and the testing. Uh, and and this brings me back to a couple of questions. And I've seen this pop up in the in the Q and A section a couple of times now, where people go like, "Well, you you talk about this digital audio revolution and networking, and and people saying like, well, it's not like networking is new. No, no, networking isn't new. Neither was digital audio when." when digital consoles started appearing in, in the live industry, right? But, and, and Rob and I, you know, Rob knows what I'm talking about, but we say this so often to people, right? We're talking about the live industry. We're talking about on-air events with potentially in arenas with thousands of people around us when, when we make this show happen. Uh, the technology isn't new, but it has reached now the point where it has developed securely and reliably enough to be deployed in these kind of environments now. And I think that's a really, really important difference there. In a studio environment, if something goes wrong, you know, even if you're recording for the biggest band or whatever, you might go like, hey guys, you hit that talkback button and you go, hey guys, let's take a 10 minute coffee break. You cannot do that in an arena during a live show, right? It just needs to happen and, and be live, right? So testing and reliability and you know, I know, a little bit about the certification processes that you need to go through to make all of this. You know, and, and we, on the Avid side, we do the same thing. We do thousands and thousands of hours of running before we actually validate something to go out into the live world. And yeah, that's a really important part of this discussion, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it takes me quite nicely to the next thing I wanted to ask Justin was, so Justin, when, you, when you're building one of your audio networks, um, there's so many options available to you now, right? There's a Dante, there's an AS67, there's AVB. How do you make the decisions about the kind of stuff you're going to use? Uh, a lot of it will come down to um, redundancy for us and certainly yep. uh, reliability. Um, you know, we, we rely heavily on Optical um, because it has been around for so long as a yep. protocol and a product. Um, and Maddie based, right? Uh, it, it's their own protocol, but you can yeah. have MADI or AES or whatever connect to it. it yeah, doesn't really matter. But um, as far as the, their network's concerned, it's it's rock solid. Sure. Um, some of it can come down to what is available to us, you know, from a supplier. Um, typically, we we specify what we want, but sometimes it, that does dictate what we use. Um, and I guess also what the production requires you know um can we do it in a ring do we have to do it in a star um you know who, who else are we interfacing with and what protocol do they use there's there's so many different things that can influence yeah. what, we, what we choose so if you're you i'm guessing at some some places you, there will be mixing consoles involved in this so i guess that mm. that informs the choice as well right which 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 console you're interfacing with what yeah. which what broadcasters need what 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 do you need for the for the live sound part of it yeah and that that's why we use so many different protocols you know we, we use a mixing console with one prop with with, with uh, one protocol we use a replay system with another uh, we have to distribute to media or broadcast and a third protocol and then we've got our, our redundancies on those as well which could be again another protocol so yeah um, yeah so it's really important that the switches can can accept everything. They can be, but they can have VLANs to keep all of these networks separate. Um, yeah. And you can you can exactly. you have control over all of them. Would you typically have a, a, a separate 
uh, computer to control each of the different formats or do you run them all from the same just open different windows in your computer or uh, typically it will have separate laptops or computers to run each application and where we're allowed yeah where, where the software is available we'll have two yeah. of those you know things like like controller you can have a primary and a secondary sitting there um, sure. on the network at the same time um i think you know like whilst we've been chicken up to on the network at the same time you know if that's available to us we'll definitely do that right okay here's a here's a question that just popped in on the q and a um i'm going to give this one to you bart i would have probably given it to luca if he was here because he loves a, a good talk on this subject what's the difference between layer two and layer three and, and what how does that apply to the to the real world well to make it not too complicated in the answer um i, I well where we know layer two is actually based on, on, on MAC addresses actually. So every single device on the network has a unique address. And actually that's, that's the basic of, of network switching actually is that, uh, packets needs to know where it, where it, uh, packets know where it needs to go based on, on the destination MAC address. So to which yeah. device it, it needs to go. And we do have some particular addresses like multicast addresses. So it can spread it to multiple devices at once. But there is, there is at, at that point at layer two, we're not talking about IP addresses yet. So the, the the switch does not know what IP address that particular packet came from or where it, where it went through. All that already uh, happened uh, up front. So the, the switch learned who has which particular uh, MAC address. So hardware address. You can you can see it as a serial number of of the device actually and 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 that's the that's the main that's the basic of of, of packet switching actually in a network switch and and also something to understand there which is an interesting point is that if the switch does not know where that packet need to go or does not understand that mac address yet it will forward it to all and that's what we see in uh, in multicast applications for example protocols that need multicast um, if the switch is not properly set or does not know how to to stream it, it will forward it to all ports on the network, so it's broadcasted on the network. Where if we go to layer three protocols or layer three actually, is that from that point the IP address becomes important, and layer three is mainly used when you want to route it to a totally different network. Um, it does not mean that that if you're using what they call a layer three network that you cannot use switches and you need to go for a route. And that's, that's a little bit of misinterpretation in, in our industry as well. What we often see is that uh, a lot of protocols like multicast IGMP or uh, uh, even look to, to AES67, for example, which is a layer three protocol. If you, if you want to use it in a local network, you, you just need, it's based on MAC address switching actually. From the moment you want to route that protocol in a broadcast environment, for example, from one side to another side, you need to go through routers. And that's where the IP address comes in on, on the packet. So it's not purely based on a, on a hardware serial number slash MAC address, but you have yeah. um, um, an, or, uh, an, an organized way of addressing it um, by IP addresses like I, of many of you will know this in, in the sense of having those four digits IP address. And this is purely to route from a, one network to another one, transporting it on net, on internet, for example. So this, and it's something we repeat oftenly actually from Luminex that there's a little bit of misinterpretation in when you have a layer three protocol that you need layer three switches and layer three switches in, 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 in that sense would mean a router for every application and Justin correct me if I'm wrong in, in there but I think uh, as soon you don't need to go to another uh, network um, there's no need of having layer two layer three infrastructure you need to you can go with layer two infrastructure where you just need switching package uh, around so that's the main difference when you're in a local network it's it's mainly based on layer two MAC address and when you once you're outside or you need to go from one network to the other you need layer three actually okay cool i That's... hope that made sense in some way so it's it's always tricky when you start uh, explaining this in a theory way where you normally have one day course to cover this so uh... 
absolutely. No, it, it's it's a common question, isn't it? It's almost like this. So I'm just, I'm just kind of thought that oh, it's, it's better. It's, it's it's one it's one bigger layer three must be better, but it's it's just different. It's it's a it's a different way to to organize. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. And that affects the latency as well, then of course, right? Um, possibly one because from the moment you start uh, need to route to a different network, you will add a, a, a different. Uh, processing in it because it needs to understand the packet correctly and then forward it to that network but I there's technology out there in routers that does that at wire speed as well so it does not necessarily add additional latency it's it's uh, it, it it really depends if we look to the nature of AVB for example is built on a layer 2 uh, infrastructure actually um, this is understood and directly handled by the hardware in a network switch if we if we see how that kind of AVB packet travels through a gigacore a luminex gigacore switch everything in there is handled on on a, on a, on hardware level so there is no processing handled uh, there's no processing in there only there's a few things in the protocol that need to do the registration and all that, but from the moment the data is flooding and the, the, the audio is flooding, the stream is flooding through the network, it's it's all based on those MAC address uh, mechanisms. So, and that's all being handled in hardware. That does not add additional latency uh, or, or big latency in, into your network. Oh, yeah. So, Chris, that um, that... Would, that... You know, one of the decisions you have to make is open versus proprietary, right? So maybe you can speak for Avid and 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 their their choice of uh, an open open uh, protocol for for transport and audio. Could you talk to that? Absolutely, because uh, well, as as you know, Rob, it's it's a question that we get all the time um, when we're out there um, doing this. Uh, people will come up and go like, why why did you choose AVB? Um, well, you know, a number of reasons, but one of the reasons definitely being. Uh, that it's an open standard and an open standard means that it's not owned by a particular company if you, if you go or an, a non-proprietary uh, uh, protocol, right? A proprietary protocol would be owned by a company um, and there's pros and cons um, but our main reason would then be we want to be in control and, and on, the, on the schematics that we were showing earlier where we we have these devices connect in our ecosystem, right? I'm, I'm just not even talking about the, the, the bigger uh, network. It's just our own where you have an, an I.O. device, a processing unit and a control surface. Those three elements need to communicate together. The I.O. Uh, needs to be, you know, the audio needs to be processed. So AVB is capable of, of uh, transporting audio streams, but it also um, and holds uh, uh, control data. We need to be able to control our microphone uh, levels, for example, and, and we need to be able to, to control things like venue link. Uh, we have a very intuitive way of, and, and all of that is embedded in that signal. And if you work with a proprietary protocol, you're not in control of that protocol. Whenever you wanted to do a firmware update or, or you find a bug and, and you, you need to control something, you would have to rely on whoever owns that protocol to work with them and fix it for you. Where in this case, we can control that environment our, ourselves. Of course, there's a standard which is set and, and Bart being part of, of setting that standard can probably speak more to that, but it does allow us to be in control and handle, and, and this comes all back to the reliability of the system as, as well, right? The first and utmost important thing for these communications is, is it reliable? If it isn't, well, then it doesn't see the, the day of light. Um, and well, that would be the main reason for choosing um, a non-proprietary protocol. Yeah. Of course, so, there's the, the time stamping, et cetera, et cetera, but you know, there's- Well, talk to that. Explain what you mean by that. Uh, yeah, so but you know, the, it's time synchronized as well. And and again, if you want to go into the really formula thing, you need to be with Bard. But you know, my my just simple. I I look at myself as a simple user. I want to be sure that if I hook up um, something that 
is, is hundreds and hundreds, potentially 500 meters over fiber apart, that if I plug in a microphone into a stage box that sits there and something else, and everything needs to be face coherent, everything needs to be aligned, everything needs to come out of those speakers. When we send signals to speakers, you know, your left and your right, they need to be in phase, right? Phase yeah. is, one sample is enough to throw it off. So um, AVB is a timestamp protocol and, and within that buffer, it just makes sure that when you send it out, it reaches that endpoint at the same time, correct? Bart, I hope I, I sort of explained that correctly. Yeah, you, you, have, you have such an accurate uh, timing mechanism uh, between the devices and, and, and the media clock of the, of the protocol call itself means uh, make sure that everything is, is sampled at the correct uh, way and, uh, and, and the accuracy of the timing is just assures that everything is so, so tight in line and there is, there's so much room for, for jitter on, on that, on that uh, infrastructure. Uh, which gives the ability to to have high quality audio, meaning in, in high uh, high frequencies. Actually, I, the, the the number of like let's ninety six, one hundred ninety two kilohertz uh, sampling, uh, whatever. But you're you're even allowed to do that high quality of audio with such tight timing uh, in in it. So. Uh, and the the point about AVB in here in particular is that every single unit. Uh, takes part in, in, in that clock mechanism. So that means that every single unit is at, at the same pace in, in the complete system. So with that kind of accuracy of clock, it means that the audio quality is enhanced, right? Or is, or it, or it lost, at least it's not lossy, at least you don't lose yeah, the quality it, of it. it. It means exactly that, that it, that it stays at the same, we, we, we can assure the quality at the end as, as well as it's been sent out. Yeah, because it's easy Between to get lost in the whole world of switches and networks. But at the end of the day, is we we need to transport the audio from A to B and 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 the most, in the way that we have the highest quality, right? Well, and in particular, things that help in AVB as well is that uh, there is a reserved bandwidth there, so you you are sure that all your packets will will travel in that network there is there this it's like a highway where, highway where there's a reserved lane for for your traffic actually yeah and no one else will be able to to, uh, to get into that so from the moment you have your application up and running you know that this not because someone else plugging in something into the network will 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 kick out because it has some higher priority my a my avb network for example so there's, there's there's some quite good reasons uh, for 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 uh, for uh, for choosing this particular protocol for that kind of applications, like there is for other applications using other protocols as well. Sure. So, so it's it's about using the correct tool for the for the, for the job, isn't it? And that's at the end of the day, that's always what it's about. So as Chris mentioned Milan there, and I know that you're involved in that. Can you just just talk a little bit to what Milan is and 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 how it relates to AVB? Yeah, I think. Um, when 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 it all started with AVB, I I can't remember was it well we started in 2011 uh, uh, looking into AVB and 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 already preparing our gigacore switches with that that technology and but we never put the energy in in the firmware from from that moment because there was uh, there was mu too much freedom in in the in the protocol itself on AVB there was too much different flavors. Uh, possible and how you're gonna transport audio, how you're gonna interconnect, how you're gonna discover each other on the network. So, and and Avid took the choice from the very beginning to to make that part of its own ecosystem. Eh? It's it's stage box and and uh, engine console uh, ring, which is yeah. which is a very good choice to go there. But from the moment you want to deploy or to interconnect to multiple brands. You need some rules in there, and that's exactly what what Milan Milan uh, brought in there. It's it's defining the rules on how we are we going to use that AVB uh, technology platform. Uh, what uh, what are the sample rates being used? How are we gonna transmit media clock? What about redundancy? Uh, how about discovery and then minimal configuration? From the moment these rules were set within Milan, we we saw that well in the Milan group you see uh, you see. The, brands which are if you if you look to the brands of speaker manufacturers in there i think when you look into the market when it's about selling speakers they're, they're pretty big competitors but they're they're joining all together in one 
in one alliance to make one protocol talk to each other and having uh, av uh, Avid in there on, on the console side, we see Milan as a, as a very uh, living group at the moment where, where multiple manufacturers are, are looking into or stepping into at this point. So, and that makes interoperability possible. Eh? So AVB on its own exists as technology for a longer time, but there was, there was no interoperability defined until Milan uh, came. Yeah, because AVB was very wide. There was the automobile industry was involved in AVB. You know, it was it was a hugely wide kind of protocol. And the Milan is just uh, would it be right to say it's a kind of it's a a definition of AVB that several professional audio manufacturers have, have agreed upon to make it possible yeah, for them to interact with each other. Yeah, it's definitely driven from the from the pro audio industry. The the Milan uh, Alliance actually were defining those set of rules on how to use AVB to make it interoperable. Um, it does not mean that you cannot use Milan outside of that scope actually, because uh, the, the technology being used is still AVB, which is as, as wide and as open for anyone to to put payload in actually. And uh, but yeah. it's setting the rules for interoperability is, is the key part in it. Yeah, I've been in a few of those discussions, just agreeing on a sample rate to do quite some time. So, yeah, it's it's not easy to get everybody, different manufacturers have different needs, but it's, it's been a long process. But the, the Milan thing, it's kind of felt to me, I don't know what you think, but it feels to me like it, it kind of came of age this year and, and last year. It, be, it became a real thing, um, a real thing that's out there in the world. And, and I've, I'm quite excited about what we're going to see this year. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something upcoming at the moment. Eh? We start releasing our firmware in uh, 2018 with, with AVB and within the uh, Milan Alliance. And uh, But it, it takes time for, for, for multiple manufacturers to to implement and, and to validate and test again. Eh? I just, just need to be first again that, that number of hours of testing before even releasing. Eh? I'm, I'm sure there are on multiple places technology on 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 the development boards that that are being worked on, but which we don't see yet at the at the moment. But uh, so Absolutely. there's there's the announcement of Milan, and then you have you need the time for for the technology to to come into the market. So yeah, I think it's going to be an exciting year, and I know that from our end, there's going to be some exciting developments with Milan this year. Um, we're, we're kind of running out of time. It's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you both. But so we're, I'm going to finish off with a few questions from the crowd. I'm looking at my Q&A down here. Um, so, okay, Justin, over to you. This is this one is for you. What is the coolest project you've ever done? The coolest project for me would be London 2012 opening ceremony. Okay. That was, that's one that stayed with me for forever, probably. That was astonishing, wasn't it? What was, what was called the director, the, 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 the film director who organized that? Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle, yeah, that, that yeah. Was, it was an amazing ceremony. That, that was, was, that must be, that was like a huge theater show. But, um, yeah, there was helicopters, James Bond, everything, right? Yeah, they had everything. Oh, just, I guess the whole, the whole London 2012 for me, because there was, sorry, there was the opening, closing, and then we stayed around for the Paralympics as well. Like, um, closing was basically everybody of who's who British artist played that right. you know Spice Girls Brian May um, George Michael like you name them they were all there yeah the it was a special it was a special energy in London at that period wasn't there it was yeah definitely. so the rehearsals for that for that opening ceremony of 2012 that must have been insane that must have gone on forever did it yeah uh, I think I was there for maybe I can't remember, four or five months in total. Right. Um, yeah, for the whole period. Um, yeah. Because you got, you, got you got the playback, you got some live audio. Um, just distributing that around the, the huge stadium is, is a job in itself, isn't it? Making that kind of vaguely time aligned. It's always a problem in stadiums, isn't it, with those kind of events? Yeah, we, we were really lucky on that one where we basically, you know, audio and lighting got to put in their own tension ring and hang the speakers exactly where we wanted them. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever see that again, but that, that, was, that was very, very cool. Why do you think that happened then? Why do you think, because sometimes even doing a bloody concert, I can't hang my speakers where I want to. 
<laughs> I don't know. The stars aligned on that one, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> yes. I, I I mean, I remember that. I was, that blew me away that, because I, I, obviously I didn't know anything about it. I hadn't seen nothing about it. And then I watched it just as a point and it, and it blew me away. But you must have watched that develop. That must have been incredible to watch that whole thing develop. Yeah, over time, watching that whole thing be built and rehearsed and you know, perfected. It was because it, yeah. it was a mixture of professionals and amateurs as well, wasn't it? So it wasn't like it was just yeah. a, a a show where everybody's professional. They were getting the kind of the, the general people in yeah, the exactly. right place and doing their thing. Yeah, very cool. So Bart, over to you. How do you top that one at twenty twelve Olympics in London? What was the coolest coolest event you've ever been or project you've ever been involved in? Well, um, the many different things, eh? and like uh, I mentioned before, I've, our roots are from the lighting, eh? but uh, and we saw a lot of nice things going on there. But I think if we look back uh, a year ago, um, deploying one of our largest AVB networks on tour with with uh, with Rammstein uh, tour yeah. was was really a very nice uh, application. Actually. Uh, learned a lot from it actually in in with with, with milan and, and avb all there uh, so set putting the, the theory in in practice actually really from there which which was also uh, with with solotech as he actually very closely followed up on um on 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 at, at rehearsals or the prepping phase actually in in validating and everything works and if if timing was right so this, the, for us, it was a really nice mix of, of real application and 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 seeing how that uh, that technology, that protocol, actually worked and and how it fit the industry. So uh, and uh, like feedback coming back, which we implement as well again in Araneo or in in other uh, features we we deploy in our switch firmware. Yeah, yeah. Chris and I were involved in that one a little bit as well. They were really pushing the envelope on on that tour. Um, and spectacular, spectacular band as well. Obviously, they had a bunch of SXLs on it too. Um, okay, so I, I was thinking, I was thinking, well, you know, there must be occasions where it all goes really wrong, Justin. What's, you know, has, has there been an occasion where you've, you know, you freaked out and maybe you find find your find your way back? Yeah, there's been a, a couple of, um, yeah, there's been a moment or two in my career where it's been like. Oh no! This this is going down. It's not everything is not well. Uh, I remember. We well, you're that calm that. about it at a time. You seem very calm. <laughs> were you, were you... <laughs> uh, you know, you, you you think you would freak out, but in those shows you know, or in those situations, you have to be calm because if you freak out, it will just the, the, the situation will just compound and and get out of control. So you you have to go. Okay, this is happening. How do I deal with it? Not, so, yeah, what specific? Have you got a specific example of that that you can share? Yeah, we're, we're doing no, no. Um, one one show we're doing in Lima. Um, we've been there for four, five weeks. Everything was running perfectly. The the opening starts happening, and about I think a minute into the first song, all my alarms start going off. Everything's broken. Everything's wrong. Like audio is still running. Show's still running, but I'm getting alarms yeah. that saying. Yeah, there's something wrong with the network, um, and it, it all came back, and I was like, "That was really weird." And we dug into it, and it actually ended up being a, a firmware bug in, in a in a switch that basically the the RAM filled up uh, over that period of time, and just so happened that exact that exact moment it was full, and it just rebooted. Oh my um, god! And it always but, happens yeah. during the show, right? It couldn't have happened the day before. I know, oh. right? But, <laughs> yeah, and you know. Up until that day, that had never happened to me on any show. Um, yeah, but yeah. So what did, did you work? Did you place. work it out at the time, or did, did you only find out afterwards what what it actually caused? It, it was only actually the next day that, that we figured out what happened, um, because you know the show is running. I don't want to go digging into the logs of switches while right. everything's running and you know, sure. upset anything else that could be could be wrong. Um, but yeah, you know, all our redundancies are in place and. The, the things that went offline and those switches, you know, went over, went over to the redundancy. And it was all fine. So, so you were feeling yes. good about the way that you'd done your redundancy then, right? <laughs> yes. The redundancy did its job. Yes, I, I got paid at the end, so that was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a kind of good thing. Yeah. <laughs> you think it's sent home in disgrace. Um, yeah. 
Bart, you've, you're doing some huge old projects over there. Uh, you know, I know you do all kinds of stuff. Have you ever had any of those those kind of moments where it all goes horribly wrong? Yeah, it always happens somewhere, I think. So, uh, but it's it's good to hear that application from from Justin as well because it's that's we need to learn from these things because I think that kind of thing that happened there, I this is the kind of alarm you need to want to have up front the next time. So, uh, um, but uh, we walked into different problems as well like and 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 we often said say uh and it comes through in that sense as well is that a lot of problems often are what we call layer one problems um cabling issues or or yeah. or, or bad devices or t something like that we've uh, i remember once on, on a huge uh, dance event actually where we were troubleshooting the network and we couldn't get our heads on it uh, what was happening uh a lot of devices were randomly uh, behaving badly on on the setup, and but in the end, it appeared that there was one device somewhere connected in the network, which was a 10 megabit device, which was actually uh, not being able to 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 handle any of the data that came into it because there was some multicast uh, or or uh, data flooded into the device and. And that device was just sending packages in the network. Hold on, slow down, please. I cannot follow. So, uh, and the actual flow control packages, and uh, and that 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 had impact on 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 a quite large part of 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 the infrastructure. And it was just like disconnecting that one device, and everything went smooth smoothly further on from from that moment. And so, and that learned us a lot as well to, to, when you look to a network problem, it's, it's very easy to point to the infrastructure and look and, and start looking into the infrastructure, but first get a good view on what you have all connected to it, see what every end device is capable of, or, or what are their requirements in there. So, and yeah, that was like, like a huge time amount being spent on troubleshooting and it was like just pulling one cable that, that did the magic in the end. Yeah. And then of course you start thinking, what, what is the root cause of this? You know, like, uh, like Justin just said, and in a live event, you're not gonna find out, but then in afterwards you, you should be able to look at logs and, and try to, to find out because you want to avoid this the next time for sure. Yeah. I've got a little phrase for that. I call that an analog problem in a digital world is so often in a digital world, you're looking for for some piece of software or something to do with the network and then sometimes it's just as something as simple as somebody's plugged something in the wrong place or used the wrong cable in or right how many times do i say that a week chris analog problem in a digital world i i stopped counting <laughs> <laughs> so um okay justin dealing with the pressure there's another question popped in how, how do you deal with the pressure that seems like a super pressurized job sat in the middle of that network for those huge events that are being watched around the world that's that's an um well, how do you how do you get over that or you know, did you go you know do you drink a lot i don't what's, what's the story <laughs> no <laughs> after we do we have a, a <laughs> party, <but> then... <laughs> oh, I'm, I was assuming not during yeah yeah <laughs> um but yeah it, it's every, every time we do one of those shows the moment we we start you just get you still get nervous, you still get shaky, but it, it's all down to preparation and, and knowing your system and knowing, you know, where everything is. And, and you know, you know, if you have a problem, you, you've got a, a team around you. Um, yeah. Because yeah, typically I'm, I'm in a room and I've got a lot of screens around me looking at what's going on, but I've got probably four or five dudes out there on the field ready yeah. to deploy for yeah. anything that could happen. So. You know, having that team around you, being well prepared, and, and knowing exactly how your system is set up, and, and where it's a preparation, is. isn't it? It's always oh, a preparation. It's key. It, like you cannot do one of these shows without being so prepared. And I'm glad to hear you say you get the shakes. Cause it's good, you know, Blazy. You're doing these huge events. I, I feel the same way, right? If I, if you know, if I'm mixing Radiohead and my hands are not shaking before the gig, then there's something wrong with me. You know, you got it. There's no point doing these kind of jobs that are kind of pressurized, high, high, you know, high adrenaline jobs unless you don't feel it, right? You, if you're not, mm. if your hands are not shaking, you're not alive. You're not, you're not enjoying it as, as much as you should. Yeah, exactly. Right. 
one more one more question and then uh, then we're going to stop it. So hopefully some people have been watching this, some young people have been watching this thinking, you know what, that's that's a great, that seems like a great kind of area of work to get involved in. I, I would recommend it as well because I think this is a, a growing area within our industry and it's definitely a place, uh, there's definitely not enough people who are qualified and are all over this. So uh, Bart, what's the best way to what's the best way to get involved in this what's the best way to get involved in networking where's where's great places to learn um i know you your company has a has had great apprenticeship schemes and stuff so so talk to that would you yeah we we do have uh, we do quite some trainings on on networking from luminex as well whether it's through our uh, channel partners or it's uh, here at luminex and of course recently with with uh, with the situation we're in uh, we're doing it uh, online and with webinars so we put a lot of effort in trying to uh, to 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 explain the technology because i like i said earlier we like to make av networking made easy but we first have to explain how networking works before we can actually say how easy we made it for you so uh, we have a, we have a bunch of um, of uh, courses actually on and also you can find some some of our uh, webinars which were recorded on on our facebook channel uh, online and uh, where we actually talk about how we have different levels of level one level two uh, networking uh, um, knowledge so we purely talk about the knowledge and then of course there's also a part where we bring that into how we cover this in giga cost which is where we then simplify again what what you actually learn but to get confidence again and in, into the network it's it's good to get to get some knowledge some inside knowledge on, on 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 it so we do offer a few bits in there but there's many things online you can find on on networking in general as well so when uh, we cover the particular side of the of the entertainment industry in, in the end with our product excellent uh, Justin, same question for you. How, you know, have you got young people coming up work within working within your company? How, what's what's the, you know, what's the the job path? I, I you know, I don't know. So so tell me. Um, there's so much information out there mm -hmm. on networking now that it, you, know, you can go to, you know, as you say, Luminex has got their training, um, but there's things like Ordinate do their courses on yeah. um, Dante. Um, yeah, there's so much free stuff out there from people like cisco and other other switch manufacturers that you can go and watch youtube um you know and another thing that you know i used to do and a couple of friends that i know have done go on ebay and buy a couple of 50 dollars old switches you know like some of the base technology and, and protocols still work on those and you know buy two switches for 50 bucks each and mess around with it at home learn how it works um, you know, yeah. What about career that, path? How do you get? How do you get in? How do you get to do your job? Whoa, how did I get to do my job? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> when, when I was, you know, working full time for a PA company, I would stay back and, you know, on a, on a weekend or late at night, you know, grab out all the stuff on the on the on the shelves and plug it all together and break it. You know, yeah. plug this in and go. Oh, that's broken. Why'd they do that? And, you know, just get your hands and your teeth stuck into it. Okay. Yeah. And then, so you work for a consultation company, right? Not for a rental company directly. Is that right? Is that a fair yeah. way to put it? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay. So Chris, any, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, I know you love plugging yeah. things in and breaking them. No, nothing that has not been said. I, I think a lot of a lot of interesting stuff in there. Don't be afraid to ask, right? We, uh, Rob, we, we say this a lot. Um, the only stupid question is the question that remains unasked, right? And yeah. I know it's a cliche to say, but it's, it's true as well. Just don't be afraid to learn. Okay. So, um, great things. All the never, I've watched all of the next trainings, right? So all of that. So. No way. We we actually went to Belgium, didn't we? Did we had a couple of days training with those guys? Yeah, which was very very good. Um, so on that note, Bart, uh, thank you so much for for joining us this evening. Uh, been absolutely amazing to have you. Um, insightful as usual. So thanks a lot, man. Thank you for for having us here as well. So it was a pleasure being here.
Great. I and hope and just then, uh, learn a bit from it. I'm, I'm sure they did, man. And Justin, thank you for joining us from Australia. Good, to, good to meet you, um, even if it's only uh, digitally, over a network. And I, I hope we meet in the flesh at some point in some big, huge gig someplace. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for all your questions. Um, we've answered some of them as we went. Um, we'll try and answer some of the other ones. Um, uh, on the uh, on the forums and stuff um, so that's it we're out of here thanks again uh, we're going to do these these webinars every couple of weeks um, and keep your eyes open for the next one okay thanks a lot goodbye everybody <laughs>